back to my podcast. Today I have a special guest with me. It's Timory from Trending with Timory on Relevant Radio. Welcome, Timory. Thank you for being here with us. It's great to be here. I'm so glad to have you. So today's topic is how we should be spending our time as Catholics. We're kind of going to dive in about social media and its grip on the younger generation. We're going to talk about, you know, TikTok. And unfortunately, I was banned off TikTok, so I don't have any updates on that. Um, And basically resetting and how we waste our time and how we should stop doing that. So why don't you give the listeners a little bit about yourself um, so they get to know you a little bit more? Sure. As you said, I host the radio and podcast, uh, Trending with Timory, wherever people like to listen, radio, podcast, you name it. And we talk about hot button issues that the culture is dealing with. uh, Everything from predominantly my area of expertise is in the sexual issues from gender, abortion, contraception, IVF, all of that. Um, A lot about marriage and family. We just talked about Shakira and Gerard Piquet. They're splitting up and interesting. A lot of people thought they were married, but Amber, 12 years later into their relationship, two kids later, they're not married and they were not the marrying type. And so what they had to share was really fascinating to kind of see a glimpse into the culture of where people are at with being anti-marriage today. So we just talked about that on the latest podcast. And my background, I worked for five years in the crisis pregnancy center as a director of education and outreach. I did a lot of our everything from um, training and education and the areas of making sure that we were in tune with what's happening in the culture, where the girls are at. Uh, we, I did a lot with fundraising and media and marketing. And it was really interesting there, Amber, because while I was in the crisis pregnancy centers, I was also sidewalk counseling. I was not a counselor in our center, except for on rare occasion, I'd have conversations about sexuality. Wow. And, and I did our chassis education and sex education programs. But it was interesting because while I was in the crisis pregnancy centers, there was a shift mm-hmm. in where these girls were suddenly coming in, identifying they're pregnant or think they might be pregnant, but they're also identifying as trans, bisexual. And what we saw, Amber, was this uh, erotic this erotic dimension of where girls were being so dehumanized in their sexuality, they were confused about how they identify. And I think that that relates even to our topic today of how impersonalized we become as a society that we've lost sight of how to relate to one another and how to understand ourselves. Absolutely. And I think social media definitely has its own little tidbit thrown in there because, you know, in a way, social media dehumanizes us in in a way um, where people only post their best perfect moments on social media, (laughs) or there's the models who don't even exist. There's this whole new thing where like I or I EA or whatever, you know, the crazy robots or whatever, they're coming up with these made up women who are perfect and they look real but Mm -hmm. they're not. And it's tricking all of these younger generations into thinking like, oh, you have to look this way or something. And celebrities don't help with that as well because of the whole plastic surgery stuff. Mm -hmm. But I feel like on social media, it's kind of almost um, magnified a bit because uh, it's everywhere. You know, if you're not on social media, you are behind on the trends. If you're not on social media, you're kind of an outcast. Um, there's really that pressure to be on it. So what is your own experience dealing with social media? That's a great question. Social media. So my upbringing was I was there when MySpace was a thing. Had MySpace been there, done that. Only bands were on MySpace when you left. You went to Facebook. And um, it's interesting because we went from, in my upbringing, we had AIM, AOL Instant Message, which doesn't even exist anymore. And it was person-to-person contact. We spent hours way too late into the night talking to each other. But then social media, because that is a form of social media, social media hits the ground running with MySpace and Facebook. And suddenly it's communication to everyone at once. And it's interesting because today we have all these platforms, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, and we could go on a whole litany of all the platforms. And I think that the fact that there are so many platforms speaks to the challenge we face and that is people feel pressure to be on more than one platform and to always have something to say now it could be an opinion about the latest school shooting we just heard about in Uvalde Texas it could be to have an opinion about what's happening with Roe versus Wade it forces everyone to either share their emotions and their thoughts or to combat what 
other people are saying. And I think that it's led to a massive uh, amount of pressure, especially for younger people, myself included, like where you feel like you always have to perform. You always have to say something. Um, you always have to respond to something. And it also is pressure because here are all these other people, Amber, sharing their thoughts and emotions, good times and bad. And you feel like you have to respond to all of them because we're social creatures. And so the social dimension of who we are is to try to respond. And so for me, kind of in a roundabout way of kind of looking at the crisis, I have had ever since really I saw in middle school some crises and problems with uh, being bullied essentially in the use of social media and how that led to me being completely detached from my friends groups uh, going from middle school into high school and social media was a part of that um, and gossiping on social media and then I also saw myself later years later in college um just my eyes would be in pain being on social media like I would be exhausted from all this use of technology I would get grumpy and you know, feeling down I you know it's easy to feel um I wouldn't say I wouldn't say I'd struggle with jealousy but I know a lot of people do but I would struggle with like needing to keep up in the respect that like wow look at all these great things other people are doing uh, like FOMO I, um, not FOMO, but like, I need to do more. Oh, okay. I need to do more. And it could be like, for me, I was really involved in pro-life work and like seeing what everyone else is doing. This is fantastic. Like I need to do something too. I need to have a say. Um, and I think that that's kind of part of that pressure in society today. Like for some it's FOMO, for some it's jealousy, for some it's like, I'm never doing enough. Right. And so I need to do more. And I think that that is where I really chose in college. I put the timers on social media. I, you know, would have a 10 minute timer on my computer that once I hit that 10 minutes, Facebook would be blocked. Um, I had no social media apps on my phone in college. Uh, only time I had them was if I was running some sort of social media campaign for a nonprofit. And even today, you know, I have those timers and try to live by them. You know, part of my work is responding to people on social media. So I think that there's a balance and I still need timers and I still need to not have it on my computer and my phone as much as possible for accountability because it's addictive. And I know that, and I know that these programs, Amber, are made to be addictive. And so that means I have to use external forces, not just my own will, to help me from just falling into this realm of being on whatever chosen media I'm on at the moment. Right. I know, especially, I think it was a couple of years ago, you also suggested the black and white challenge where everybody turned their phones on like black and white. And I was like, oh, I should try that too. Because like, <laughs> yes <laughs> oh I love it you still have it yes. I tried it for a while and I'm always just like okay but when I post pictures and stuff how do I see what they look like <laughs> and so that's what ended up doing me in but I mean so many younger people are being wrapped into social media due to the fact that all their friends are on social media and not just that but also companies and things are on social media some people like that's how they run their company is through yes. social media advertisements yes. and things other people though, they're like, oh, find us on Facebook or find us on Instagram and do all these things. It's almost impossible to avoid it nowadays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and people who don't have it, I mean, all the more power to them. That's awesome that if you can live without social media, but a lot of people they're viewed more as like the outcast, like as people who don't, aren't keeping up to date with the current events, people who live under a rock, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And according to the Mayo Clinic in a 2019 study, more than 6,500 12 to 15 year olds in the US, um, they found that those who spent more time, like more than three hours a day using social media might be at heightened risk for mental health problems. Now, I know you mentioned that earlier that like the, the impact that this has on the youth, like it can trigger a mental health pandemic. I mean, that's what TikTok did not too long ago. Um, it basically triggered this, Meant where if like a person was to like a video of somebody posting something depressed, more suicidal things would pop up on their feed, more depression would pop up on their feed. Um, and so in a way, when they ran these studies and things, um, they found that like the, on TikTok, especially if you're, if you even like hesitate over a video for a couple seconds or something longer than another one, they'll start putting more of that on your, your feed. It's so crazy how it's addicting 
And with the mental health problems that this generation's all already facing, um, it just keeps getting worse. Um, and so how, how does social media affect our brains? How is it so addicting? What do they do to make that addicting? I think a good place to start is you mentioned the black and white challenge that I launched about five or six years ago. And I turned my cell phone into black and white and I will, you know, flip it on for color when I need to, or want to look at a photo I took (laughs) of my baby or a family photo or whatever it is and to post it as well, because I also am guilty of the same thing you just mentioned. We use social media to do the work we do and to spread the good news. Um, But I chose black and white years ago because I was doing all this research, Amber. And what I was learning was that it's not just social media, it's our screens. And I think that that's a really good starting point. Our screens are developed in a way in which all of the lights, the pings, the notifications, everything about the way the phone notifies us and communicates with us is a means to get us to use that that particular technology as much as possible. So whether it's your iPad, your iPhone, whatever it is that we are spending more time on. And now you add these incredibly well-developed apps and programs like Instagram, they're all designed and they have specialists who come in who are addictive specialists who are working to get you to spend as many hours as possible on them. The CEO of Netflix some years ago said that his biggest competitor is sleep. His biggest competitor is sleep. Why? Because if you sleep, you're not binge watching. Hmm. I mean, just look at, I mean, any um, streaming platform today from who to Amazon, Disney plus whatever, it immediately sets up the next thing you can watch. And it has that 10 second thing where it'll either automatically start the next show or the next video, or you can click yourself and watch it sooner. Let's be real. Many of us click it to watch sooner, or some of us wait and say, oh, it's inevitable. We'll just keep watching. All of these are built so that we spend as much time as possible. And they have addictive experts there to create these programs so that their goal is to change behavior. And Mm -hmm. that behavior, the goal is for us to be spending more time on their platforms. And so with black and white, that was one means I had, and we all have, again, it's a little extreme. Um, It's not exactly why we have an iPhone or an (laughs) iPad, uh, but it was one means for me to have a greater level of self-control when it came to my technology. Can it give you absolute self-control? No, but here's the deal. The lights on our phone are actually addictive in and of themselves. They're stimulating. They're Mm -hmm. stimulating, the color's attractive, and it draws us in to want more. Same with the notifications. The notifications keep us going with adrenaline racing, our chemicals and hormones that are stress chemicals making us think we have to check. That's why you hear of things such as the phantom vibration or Uh, the phantom ring. That's actually stress hormones and chemicals working in our body saying, hey, you're like constantly checking your phone. Maybe you need to check it out. Oh, I think it vibrated. And it's literally causing habits and behavior. And so the black and white challenge, here's what happened. Put my phone on black and white. I remember picking up my phone in the car one day at a stop light and I look at it and it's on black and white and I go I literally said this out loud to my phone I said you are so dissatisfying (laughs) and I put my phone back down and after I said this out loud thank god I was alone in the car I realized wow I'm picking up my phone because just the color and interaction alone is so stimulating it's a comfort to me when I'm quote-unquote bored of the stoplight in the car and so all of this really came to help me understand and research and see that from the colors to the notifications we are um, our behavior is changing it's addictive we don't have control over it even if we like to claim that we do I can argue that I don't even often today and I try to be really good with my phone and so turn Turning off all the notifications, trying to have your phone on black and white as much as possible, deleting most of the apps you use. Our technology needs to be a tool, Amber. And I think that that's the shift that has to occur to help us understand that otherwise, as you're mentioning, social media is doing damage to our brains and changing our behaviors. Right. I know when I was, um, I think it was two years ago for Lent. I was like, wow, I'm on social media way too much. So I decided to only be able to access social media from my computer. Mm-hmm. Um, now that didn't include Instagram because, in, you know, Instagram wasn't 
really on the computer at all. But when I posted, I would have it on my phone, but then I would delete it right away and I could only access things from my computer. And then that way I choose to go to the app. It doesn't choose to come to me mm -hmm. and like make me pick up the phone from like a notification and being like, oh, you have to check it now. Um, I got to choose when I would go and, um, you know, check my notifications. And so I think the most common, um, I want to say the most common app this day, like these days is TikTok. It's everywhere. It's, it started off as Vine and then it turned into Dub Smash and then from Dub Smash to Musical.ly and now Musical.ly turned into TikTok. And I see an insane amount of problems. I mean, we remember when there was the Tide Pod challenge and so many young adults either died or was hospitalized for just biting a Tide Pod. I, <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me, but they did it because it trended on TikTok uh -huh. and they were just like, we want to be up with the, up with the cool kids. And I'm like, that's, that's not it, sweetheart. <laughs> um, it's just crazy to me. And I got permanently banned on TikTok, um, actually on what my happened? birthday. I, so I just posted like Catholic videos and stuff. And, um, the only videos that were really flagged though, it wouldn't be the ones that you would think would be controversial. It was the videos of like my cat and like Saint quotes and my, my snake. Those were the ones that were like flagged and I they, know it's pretty creepy. You have a snake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess they don't like snakes, but the main thing was, is that it was like just stuff that, you know, anybody could have posted and um they banned me first i submitted an appeal i was like well this is dumb because they sent me the videos that they thought were like dangerous and it was like videos of my cats and i'm like what does it make any sense so i submitted an appeal and they were like oh lol sorry like here's your here's your account back and so i went onto my tiktok account and just told them like hey tiktok tried banning me so if i permanently get banned at some point uh follow me on these other platforms so you can keep up with what i'm doing and the next day, which was my birthday, I got permanently banned. They were just like, oh, yeah. actually, though, we're going to ban you for, for good. And so I can't even make an account. I can't even get on TikTok at all anymore. Um, so even if I made a new account under a new email or something, they would not allow me to uh, create a new account. So it's crazy to me. Um, but I guess, what are your thoughts on TikTok? I know you kind of did a, a session about this a couple months ago. What what why are the youth addicted to it yeah well I mean, like a lot of the other social media platforms tiktok in particular it, it functions as a means of constantly bringing the content to you you don't search for the content on tiktok right right you you have it delivered to you and it's all based on how long you spend on a video, if you rewatch it, if you hesitate in looking at something, the algorithms are in very, very intentional to bring and drive you to look at something, to view something, and to uh, have you change your mind about something. And we are literally, ha we have no control over what we're receiving on TikTok. And I think that that's what's um, concerning, first and foremost, if we don't realize that that's how the platform works. And now a lot of people argue, well, it's just fun and funny. And some people will really just use it for fun and funny content. And that's all they receive. That might be you. But as you mentioned earlier, there was a study showing that if you look at depressed content, you will literally just see depressed and what ultimately leads to practically suicidal content. And the reality is, is that there was even a couple months ago, a study done that there, have you heard of the TikTok Tourette's? Have you heard of this? Is that like where people pretended to have Tourette's or something? No, people were not pretending to have Tourette's. What happened was, so for example, John Hopkins University, um, they have their medical clinic. John Hopkins Medical Clinic prior to COVID maybe saw two to 3% of their pediatric patients each year who prior to COVID had some form of Tourette's syndrome. Well, mm -hmm that would be like a normal development of Tourette's. Well, what we're seeing is that as of last year, 2021, it was one to two in 10 patients who had sudden onset of Tourette's-like symptoms. 
weird what? movements, weird movements, and suddenly yelling out very odd things. Now, this came from a social media sensation and YouTuber and TikToker, where basically this led to really odd behavior where people were developing this sudden onset of Tourette's. Mm-hmm. And this was seen not just from John Hopkins Medical Clinic, but others as well in the United States in particular, and other nations were even noticing it. And what it was is that we're seeing this effect from TikTok, Amber, where people's behaviors are shifting. That's Mm -hmm. the goal of a social media. And one area we see this in particular as well is that it's also leading to the trans effect where suddenly many young women today are identifying as transgender, no um, prior tendency toward that, um, no no prior gender dysfunction onset it's sudden it's abrupt and these kids are suddenly it's not just kids it's you know really 13 12 year olds all the way up into college age who are suddenly choosing to go on cross-sex hormones and even go so far as to have parts of their body amputated and this is insane and it's because of the way these algorithms and technologies are being used by us we can't just blame tiktok right I mean, also, though, it's like, I think um, a while ago, I heard somewhere where it was like becoming a trend now to be bi or to be gay. It wasn't necessarily like, oh, I actually identify as it. It was more of like, but it's a new trend that I want to follow. And because of group, um, I forget the exact term, but like basically group manipulation. If you're in a group of people who um, are saying things that are like, oh, being trans is like this and, you know, I want to be trans and blah it kind of feeds into the group circle and everybody starts this group thinking Mm -hmm. of, um, oh, it's a new trend and we should all be like this. So I've totally seen that in Mm -hmm. colleges and uh, even younger, even in like middle school. Yes. It's really heartbreaking. Yeah, it's sad because what it ultimately is, is our inability to function in one of the most basic human functions and that is we're social creatures Mm. we're made for relationships we're made for love and people are looking for relationships and love online and i'm sorry but a computer just can't do it for you i I mean a computer a cell phone just cannot do it for you and so that social influence um, people are trying to feel something they're trying to experience anything and for some that's going so far as to chemically and physically castrate and manipulate your body to try and feel something or because people on social media are saying come here we'll be your family we'll love you we'll be your glitter family and they push and push people to change their identity but people aren't interested in this gender uh, transition what they're interested in is that love and affirmation that they're not even satisfied with what with what they find online and so I think that Amber a big takeaway is that and I know a lot of people don't like to hear this because it seems you even mentioned at the beginning of this conversation that to not be on social media today makes you almost seem like you live under a rock or to be Mm -hmm. a social outcast and we need to push against that stigma Um, and more so against that mindset that we ourselves have. I really am of the opinion that if we are in high school and even in college, social media isn't doing us any good. It's making us sad, lonely, depressed, isolated. And the studies show that people who aren't on social media, especially in high school, fare far better and have more self-control if and when they choose to be on it when they are older. Right, and actually having the choice, um, basically having control like that's the main thing it's social media has control over so many people and so many people don't have control over social media and I think that's where the addiction really plays in and I saw um I don't love Twitter but when I was on Twitter once I saw this tweet basically saying that um because so many of us are addicted to our phones nobody thinks it's an addiction Mm -hmm. but if only one person was addicted to their phone we would all think they needed help Mm -hmm. um So I find it interesting where things like that happen. Like we see people who are addicted to like pornography and stuff like that. And obviously there is a grave sin, you know, attached with that. But because everybody's on social media, everybody's looking at their phones, everybody constantly has a phone in their hand or some kind of technology, even babies. Mm -hmm. um, We don't see it as an addiction or, um, you know, a digital epidemic, so to speak. Right. Oh, I I think that that's a really good point. If only one person were doing this, no one would think it would be odd or people would think it were odd, but because it's not, 
we normalize what everyone else is doing. And that is a social contagion. We don't want to admit it, but that is a social contagion. And and I think that some people kind of start to wake up to this when they have kids and they realize like, oh, wow, I'm distracted by my phone. Some people don't. Their kids are literally there standing in front of them vying for their attention and they're ignored. And so kids are learning from a very, very young age that the phone is more important and that they are not. And so they are struggling. I mean, little, little kids with loneliness, with lack of affirmation. They're not receiving very basic things from their parents that lead to important developmental jumps to help them in being affirmed, well-adapted children, and then take those kids into high school, into college years, and then also give them their own technology use. And it's really sad what's being done to children today, yet we don't want kids to feel left out because they don't, because we don't want them to look weird for not having a cell phone or social media. And I think we have to push back against that narrative. Right. No, absolutely. And I mean, social media in general, it's just wrecking havoc on so many people's lives. And yet they don't realize it because uh, like you said, it's addicting. They, you know, they want to feed into it. And when kids are given iPads because parents think iPads are good babysitters. Well, that just feeds the trend of, you know, a very mentally ill, you know, generation um, because they're not getting the affirmation they need from their parents. I guess in general, like social media, it seems to be the biggest time waster, but I also think we can waste time with other things like going out and partying, not spending our time, you know, very well, procrastinating, watching TV shows. Like yesterday, I was watching a TV show and like you said, it was on that 10 second loop. And I was just like, oh, I'll just watch the next one. Oh, I'll just watch. And then before I know it's like 2 a.m. And I'm just like, hmm, maybe, maybe I should not. But they do it in such a way where it almost seems like um, you don't realize it's the next episode until like the theme song plays. And then I'm like, oh, well, I'm already hooked on it. So I might as well watch the rest of it. And I don't realize how detrimental that is and how much time we actually waste on these things because we get into like this trance almost um, when we watch TV or we're on our phones and we think only like 15 minutes has gone by, but really it's been like an hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or multiple hours. As you said, it's so easy to just uh, sit and watch that next episode. And it's because when we are comfortable, we don't like to change things. Mm -hmm. When something's easy, we just go for it. And I always think of the quote from St. Or sorry, Saint Pope Emeritus Benedict the Sixteenth. He said, "The world offers you comfort, but you are not made for comfort. You're made for greatness." I love and that. And I really do believe, Amber, that that should be a battle cry for this generation. The world offers you comfort, but you are not made for comfort. You're made for greatness. Push back against the norms push back against accepting the status quo of behavior in our own lives. We're not made to be ordinary. We're made to be extraordinary. God created us to be with him. And that means practicing virtue when it comes to, okay, I'm going to commit to only watching one episode. I'm going to commit to only spending five minutes on social media. And if you can't, and the gospel readings for today talk about if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Now, we're not literally supposed to pluck out our eyes, but we're not even willing to delete an app on our phone or to change to an old school lousy flip phone or whatever it might be oh, because we're embarrassed. Right. I mean, the old flip phones, they got rid of by me. Like you can't buy flip phones anymore by me, which is right. like ridiculous. You can get a dumb phone though, where you right. can like only make calls and texts, which I think is like super cool. I, um, I would change in a heartbeat if I could. The Gab phone. So if someone wants that, the Gab phone is one resource. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. Cause that sounds awesome. You know, I have a friend who wants to do that. How do you see yourself wasting time, like specifically in your own personal life? And how do you see that impacting your faith life? Mm, well, So we actually, I'm going to sound like someone who lives under a rock here, but we got rid of our TV before we had our baby girl a year and a half ago. And we got rid of it because we really didn't want to raise her on a screen. Um, And we just, there's so much to do. It's a time waster. And if we had a bigger home where the TV wouldn't be the center of the house, because think about it, you go to someone's house, it's the center of the whole house. It's the vocal point. And I really didn't want that. And so we didn't have a space in our home where it could be a separate area away from the main visiting area. And so 
we got rid of it. <laughs> we got rid of it. And um, why do I say that? Well, I think it's been really helpful because I realize now I look back, I'm like, where on earth did I have time to watch TV? And we right. don't really, on occasion, my husband and I will watch a show together. Like on occasion, maybe there's a season of a new show that comes out and, you know, we'll enjoy watching it together and really have a max and maybe watching one, maybe two episodes on a weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, but I look back, I'm like, okay, sure, maybe I used it while I folded laundry <laughs> or maybe put something on while I cooked, but I couldn't imagine using that all the time the way I did before. And so I think that I realized how much of a time waster consuming content can be. Mm-hmm. And that's both the videos, the articles, I mean, YouTube, I mean, everything. I think that those are big time wasters that when you take that out of your life, you don't realize that there's more than enough to fill that void. Right. And I think that even things such as like, you know, checking our email incessantly and all the little things that just waste time. I think having boundaries has been so important for me and trying to stick to those and have conversations. Like at least for me with my spouse, I regularly checking in, like I've been terrible with checking my email too much today or whatever it might be. Right. No, that's so true. I mean, I noticed too, it's like when I waste my time, I'm like, ah, I could be praying or like, ah, I could be working. And so it's, it's also trying to find that balance between, you know, working and resting. But I always considered resting to be more like going for a walk, getting away from the house, getting away from work, um, maybe going fishing, going for a hike. Um, I never really saw, you know, sitting down and watching a movie or something as like, relaxing because most of the movies and TV shows that I would watch are like suspenseful and like stressful. And so I'm like, how is this relaxing? But yes, it's interesting to see that. So I best, I guess just to like recap, it's like um, the black and white challenge is great to help with, um, you know, the addiction of the lights and just how addicting the phone is made in general. And then setting app timers. I know I found that very helpful. I did that for a really long time too. Um, You can only access social media from like your computer, turn off your notifications, like completely turn them off. I found that helpful. And honestly, if you have time to scroll through Instagram for like an hour, you have time to pray. You have time to go to adoration or you could use that hour to go to daily mass. Um, Our time can be used in so many other healthy ways. And I think that this is really good, what you're saying, especially that you bring up prayer because we can set better priorities first. So maybe, you know, one of my things is I really don't check my email or use my phone. I have it kind of locked down other than phone calls until 10 o'clock every day. Right. And because the reality is there are plenty of other things I should be doing until then. And um, I think that that's one example. But what my thing is, is that I should not even look at my phone. Unless mm-hmm. perhaps it's to check the weather because I need to turn on the AC or something or to make sure I'm not going to miss an appointment for the day. I shouldn't even check my phone until I prayed. I have no business checking my phone until then. And so, and what does that prayer look like? It's same thing in the evening, you know, having that hour or two before bed where you don't use your phone, that self-control, you're practicing virtue and temperance, and you're helping set yourself up for successful sleep because we know all these lights at night Blue prevent light. us from sleeping. Yeah. And then we're wound up and we can't sleep and then that leads to anxiety and depression as well exactly no it's so true well thank you so much Timory for coming on here and and discussing this with me it's been wonderful thank you for being with me Amber of course so that was Timory from trending with Timory on relevant radio don't forget to go check her out she's on at 6 p.m central time and also this is my last episode for season two so stay tuned for the fall and keep up on my other social medias like Instagram and YouTube if you want to keep up with other information so with all of that being said I hope you guys enjoyed this episode and I will talk to you guys in season three bye (laughs) 